Do you want to improve your garden soil, but you're not sure what amendments to add? Maybe you've tried soil testing, but the results are confusing and hard to interpret. We're making it easy to test and amend your soil for healthier gardens and higher yields. In this video, we'll discuss how to collect samples, where to get your soil tested, how to interpret the results, and how to amend your soil to improve texture, pH balance, nutrient availability, and more. Stay tuned until the end of this video to find out how you can get a free copy of our basic soil amendment chart for easy advice on soil health. Now let's get started. All right, we are down in the garden. I am getting ready to do our soil samples for the new year. So it is January here in central Arkansas. So this is one of our prime times to be able to take soil samples in our garden. No matter where you garden, the best time to test your soil is in between growing seasons. For example, after your final fall harvest, but before planting spring crops, while your garden beds or high tunnels are empty. Before you start collecting samples, however, you should locate your nearest soil testing facility. Many gardeners test their soil through county extension offices operated by their state's land grant university. County extension offices are fantastic resources for farmers, ranchers, and gardeners, providing guidance on topics like planting dates and native species, community events like garden clubs and educational presentations, and services like soil testing. We've included a link in the description of this video to help you locate your county extension office. There, you can request sample boxes for soil testing. Make sure you know how many areas of your garden you want to test so you can request the appropriate number of boxes. Basically, we've got 16 different locations here in the garden that we're gonna be having to take samples for. So my first step was to actually create a diagram that lays out exactly where all of the blocks that I'm testing are gonna be so that I can find them again in the future. We are gonna start with block one today. So we're gonna start with the most basic one that every gardener already has on hand, a trowel. Just a really basic trowel is really all you need for a soil test. If you're doing a lot of soil testing like we are, we like to use soil probes. So this is a really nice specialized soil probe. So you can actually use your foot to help push down if the soil is really compacted or if it's really dry. So once you're taking your samples, uh, you're gonna go ahead and put it in a bucket. I've just got a really basic bucket, literally anything will do. You just need some kind of item to put all your samples into so that you can mix it up and then put the actual sample into a box. This is one that I got directly from the county extension office, which is handy because it has all of your instructions right on the box and it has a place where you can put all your information on it so that they can keep it straight when they get their samples from you. Now that we've gathered all of our tools, let's head down to the garden and go ahead and take our samples. This was where we had our winter squash, and then we went ahead and tarped it right afterwards. It's got a lot of really good dead material on it, and so the first step that we're gonna have to do is actually push some of that dead material aside so we can get to the soil. So I have grabbed my soil probe, and I've already previously marked it at about six inches, and that's about how deep I want these cores to go. Just go ahead and push it down gently until you get to about that mark. Do a little bit of a turn on it so that the soil will stay in your probe, and then pull it on out. And so you can actually see it's got that soil still in your probe. And from there, you can just tap it right into your bucket. All right, so that is one partial sample. So every single one of these boxes that we're gonna be sending into the county extension office are gonna actually contain 12 samples per block. So I've got one down, I've got 11 more of these to go. It's important to collect each partial sample from a different area of your garden bed or tunnel to create an accurate representation of the soil in the whole block. After collecting all 12 soil cores from this block, we'll put the partial samples in our bucket and prepare them for testing. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix these samples together a little bit just so it's homogenous. We have a very high clay content here, um, so you'll see a lot of these are sticking together a little bit, so it's kind of helpful to just break up some of those clods. Now, if you are only able to take samples when it's really wet outside, uh, you can also lay your soil out to dry a little bit after you take those samples, because you don't want it to be very wet. I've got a pretty good mixture here of all of our 12 samples. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in my sample box. So I went ahead and I filled it all the way up to the top. You can see that that box is totally full. So this is about a pint. I'll go ahead, close up my little sample box, and I'll finish marking that and send it off to the extension office. 
After collecting samples from the rest of our garden blocks, we'll send our sample boxes to the county extension office. From there, they'll be sent to our state soil testing lab, where the samples are processed and analyzed to determine nutrient availability, pH level, and potential amendments. This information is then compiled into a soil test report and sent back to us. Welcome back. It's been a couple of weeks since we did our soil tests. We've got our soil results back right here, and so now it's time to really get into it and start interpreting these soil results. Let's go ahead and start with soil organic matter. So this is gonna come up on your soil test labeled either organic matter, soil organic matter, sometimes it's just SOM. This is one of the most important factors when it comes to the health of your soil. It's not necessarily a mineral or any type of an amendment that you can add specifically, but it is super important in helping with the health of your plants and yields, as well as the texture of your soil and the ability of your plants to grow well. Be sure to track those trends in your soil organic matter because if this number keeps increasing each year that means that your soil is just becoming healthier over time. After looking at your soil organic matter on your soil test, the next three things to pay attention to are the three most important nutrients when it comes to plant growth. Those three nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those three nutrients are often known as NPK, and that's because those are the symbols on the periodic table for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You're gonna see those a lot in different fertilizers or amendments that you might find at garden centers, but it just refers to what levels of each of those three nutrients nutrients are included in that product. So nitrogen is actually pretty difficult to test for and you're not gonna necessarily see it on your soil test, but it is very closely tied to your soil organic matter. So if you do have a raising percentage of soil organic matter in your samples, chances are you also do have some residual nitrogen in your soil. Depending on the crop that you plan to grow in the coming year, your extension office may make some recommendations on nitrogen levels or amendments that you want to include. It is one of the most important nutrients when it comes to leafy plant growth. And if you don't have enough of it in your soil or you're not adding more every year as it gets leached out of your soil, you may end up with some stunted plants. They may not grow properly in the leaf development area and it's just not gonna have a good yield. But on the other side of things too, if you add way too much nitrogen, you are going to have so much leafy growth. They're gonna look like really healthy plants, but that's all they're gonna do. You're not gonna have high yields in your fruits or in your roots or whatever you're trying to get out of that crop. And there's also a high chance of it running off into waterways and, and causing problems elsewhere. So make sure you're not adding too much nitrogen, and if it doesn't say anything about it in your test, chances are you won't necessarily need more. If you are looking to add some nitrogen in an organic way, your best chances are compost or composted manure. Alright, let's go ahead and move on to phosphorus, or P, on your soil test. This is another one of your vital nutrients, and it's very important in the formation of fruits and seeds in your crops. The healthy levels on your soil test that you're looking for for phosphorus are between 25 and 50 ppm. PPM just stands for parts per million and it's just the most common unit of measurement when it comes to anything soil related and you're gonna see it all over your soil test. So just know that that's just the unit of measurement. Some amendments that you can use specifically for phosphorus are, of course, always compost and manure are top ones for anything. You can also add bone meal or fish meal, or if you are looking for just a quick, easy option, um, organic fertilizers that are high in your P levels, those are geared specifically for phosphorus are also an option. Potassium is one of the most important nutrients when it comes to moving water throughout the plant and making sure that the plant is able to withstand drought, which is huge right now. Without it, you're gonna end up with stunted growth. Uh, you could also end up with a chlorosis, which is basically the leaves that are yellowing. You might see some kind of green veins on them and they're just not able to photosynthesize properly. So without the proper amount of potassium, you'll just end up with a lot of stunted plants and very low yields. The levels that you're looking for on your soil test are between 40 and 80 ppm. If you do have low levels of potassium in your soil, there's a lot of different amendments you can add, including alfalfa meal, kelp meal, you've got your green sand. If you do need to make a quick adjustment in your soil and you haven't had a chance to do it before planting, you can go ahead and add potassium sulfate as well, and that'll make a quick adjustment for you. You can even add wood ash, uh, but make sure when you're not adding too much of that because it can change the pH of your soil as well. Speaking of pH, let's go ahead and talk about how it shows up on your soil test and what that means for your soil. So an ideal range for your pH is gonna be between six and seven. In this tunnel in particular, we're right at 6.5, which is that optimum range. And so it's a lot easier to grow crops 
In block eight of our fields here, you can see that our pH is 5.9, which is a little lower or more acidic in pH terms than what we would want. So we will be adding some applications of lime to help improve that. Make sure you stick to the recommendations on your soil test or to what's on the packaging when applying lime because too much of that can also result in some chlorosis in your field. If your pH is in the higher range, which is gonna be above seven, that's gonna be in the alkaline range and you're gonna to wanna to lower it down a little bit. Sulfur is always your best bet for that. Make sure you take note of when you do apply that sulfur because sometimes it can take all the way up to a year for you to start seeing results in your pH. To make interpreting your soil tests even easier, We've created a basic soil amendment chart, so you can quickly reference all the information in this video and more. If you're finding value in our content, please like this video and subscribe for even more garden advice. Now back to Sarah. Okay, so we have covered soil organic matter, NPK, and we just did pH. And those are the three most important factors that you are gonna get from your soil test. But there is a lot more information on that soil test. Let's dig in. All right, let's kick it off with calcium. Calcium is essential in building up cell walls. There's also a lot of deficiencies that can come with calcium. And the biggest one that you'll often see is in tomatoes. It's called blossom end rot. It's basically where the bottom of the tomato just starts rotting away right where the flower was attached. And that's almost always a calcium deficiency. Just make sure that you have above 300 ppm in your calcium range. And if you are too low, there are ways that you can amend it. The main organic ones that you're gonna be looking at are gypsum, lime, and bone meal. But if you have an even smaller garden, you can actually just crush up some eggshells and that'll give a really good calcium boost. You can also use wood ash in this situation, but use it sparingly because remember, it does affect the pH of your garden. All right, our next one is gonna be magnesium, which is essential in the photosynthesis of the plant. Without it, it's not gonna photosynthesize properly. And the level for that is gonna be above 35 ppm. If you're needing to raise those levels of magnesium, you can use Epsom salts or lime. Next comes sulfur, which often shows up on your soil test as sulfate, which is the version that plants can actually use. And the range for that that you're looking for is between seven and 15 ppm. If you are low on your sulfur or sulfate levels, again, you can use potassium sulfate here as that contains both potassium and sulfur. Finally, we have iron and you're looking for a range between 10 to 20 ppms on that. Iron deficiencies in your soil can result in another type of chlorosis. This is an iron chlorosis versus the potassium chlorosis. The symptoms are very similar. You're gonna have yellowing of the leaves, dark green veins, and you're gonna have a really stunted crop. The best amendment to use to raise your iron levels is gonna be a blood meal, and you can find that at pretty much any garden center. If you're not sure where to get started or where to start looking for these amendments, we have compiled a list of all our favorite products in the description, so check it out. Now that we know which amendments we need for our soil, I'll show you how to apply them and work them into our soil. Based on your soil test, the amendments you need will determine the time of year that you will be applying them. For example, we've already talked about how nitrogen can leach out of your soil very easily, so it's best to apply any type of a nitrogen amendment soon before you end up putting in your crops. In contrast, an amendment such as sulfur would take a lot longer in the soil to break down in a way that plants can actually use the nutrients. So make sure that you would apply some of those much further in advance, for example, fall or winter before you put in a crop. And then there are also some amendments, for example, manure, if it's not been composted, that can burn your crops if you add them too soon before transplanting or direct seeding. If you're not sure when to apply those amendments, check out our basic soil amendment chart. We've got it linked in the description for you. I'm gonna go ahead and amend a bed with some feather meal, which is a nitrogen supplement, and show you how we do that here. The first step is determining how much of each amendment you need. For a packaged amendment like feather meal or bone meal, find the application rate on the package. For this feather meal, the application rate is 20 pounds per 1,000 square feet for a light application, or 25 pounds per 1,000 square feet for a heavy application. To determine the square footage of your garden bed, Multiply the length by the width. This high tunnel is 30 feet by 90 feet, so our total area is 2,700 square feet. Now we can determine the amount of amendment we need by multiplying our total area by the application rate. When we enter the amounts for our feather meal amendment, we get a total of 54 pounds. As long as you know the size of your garden and the recommended application rate, you can use this quick formula for any amendment. 
Once you have measured out that amendment that you're going to be spreading, clear the area where you are prepping your bed, make sure any past crops are gone or weeds, and you can go ahead and start sprinkling your amendment over the top of the soil. Once your amendment is spread evenly across the soil, you're gonna go ahead and start working it into the soil. My favorite way to work amendments is by using a broad fork. If you don't have a broad fork or you're doing a very large area, you can use a BCS walk behind tractor, which is something that we do use here a lot of times in our outside blocks. Use your power harrow attachment as that doesn't disrupt much of the soil below the surface. And if you're doing a small garden backyard and you don't have any of these tools, just a simple rake or garden fork, even just a shovel can all work. I really like using broad forks because it is a very gentle way of moving the soil around. It helps with the aeration of your soil and it's small enough that it can fit in small areas such as a tunnel where you can't necessarily bring a tractor or a walk behind tractor in. It protects the soil organic matter that you already have in the soil so you're not disrupting it. After I have broad forked the whole section, I'm gonna go ahead and use a rake to just smooth it out and make sure that the bed is flat enough for our drip lines. The final step to amending your beds is watering it in. This can be done using drip tape, a hose, a sprinkler, other kinds of irrigation systems, but you wanna make sure that you water it in to help incorporate it into the soil and activate whatever you've added. Make sure you're applying the right amendments at the right time with our basic soil amendment chart. This document contains optimum ranges for soil nutrients, recommended amendments, and application times for all the topics we've discussed in this video. You can download a free copy at the link in the description of this video and start boosting your soil health today. Put that healthy soil to use by growing tons of organic tomatoes with this step-by-step -step guide. Or manage all your crops with this life-changing garden planning app.